so much for everyone who's on the call today. Um, today's webinar will be focused on really navigating the intricacies of creating a compelling medical school or PA school um, statement. And I'm really thrilled to be the moderator of today's discussion with our esteemed guest speakers for today. Um, so before we get started, just a quick note to the group that um, you will have access to the Q&A box as well as the chat function throughout the session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and drop your questions in there. I will do my best to monitor and we will get to them towards the end of the presentation. I um, also encourage you to stick to the end because we have a short survey for your feedback on how today's session went and would love to collect those. Um, so without further ado, just want to dive right into the discussion. Um, our speakers are experts in both the medical field and PA um, field as well and have graciously agreed to share their insights and wisdom with us today. And so we have a series of really thought-provoking questions lined up um, to get us started. So today we have Caroline Weeks. Um, she is a physician assistant with over seven years of experience as a registered diet, dietitian nutritionist specializing in pediatric subspecialties. Um, and we also have Dr. K, who is an Instagram content creator and a physician who loves sharing her life and everything medicine on her page. She is passionate about medical education and representation in medicine. So just want to quickly dive right into the conversation. And thank you both so much for being here. I'm really excited about um, what we're going to talk about today. So to kick us off, just quickly share your journey and your experience in the medical field and sort of what led you here today. And we'll start with you, Dr. K. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you, Janie, for the introduction. Um, essentially, I uh, my journey here was obviously into medicine was like a love for public health and prevent preventative health, which led me to primary care. But um, during this journey, I served on ADCOM in med school and then also in residency, I was chief resident. So I oversaw a lot of the admissions part of it. So I got to review lots of personal statements um, as well as write my own and help others along the way. So um, with that and my experience with my degree in uh, writing communications in undergrad, um, this is definitely a part of the medical field that I'm passionate about because I think as um, healthcare workers and future healthcare workers, sometimes we learn so much about the left brain um, events and type of studies, but we don't really learn how to like sell ourselves or like, you know, express ourselves properly. So it's really a joy to now not only be on webinars like this, but also to help people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. And how about you, Caroline? Thank you. It's such a pleasure to finally meet Dr. Colon. Am I saying your last name right correctly? Colon. Colon. Yeah, almost. Colon. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So good to meet you in person. Um, and thanks for having me and thanks for everybody in the audience today. Um, as you mentioned, Janie, I uh, started my career as a registered dietitian uh, nutritionist and worked clinically as um, a nutrition provider in the medical uh, world. Um, Outside of that, I have uh, a lot of experience over 10 years in the nutrition, health, and wellness media kind of sector. And so I worked at Mayo Clinic prior as a dietitian and was on one of the um, sort of boards for contacting and being contacted as a nutrition expert from major media outlets like USA Today, things of that nature, and um, also have been a, a health and wellness writer and contributor for a lot of media outlets. So uh, like Dr. Kalan said, you know, uh, communication in your field will always be important. I think it's crucial for any field we go into. I recently went back to school and obtained my physician assistant degree. So I'm now practicing in the medical field as well, full time, but maintain my dietitian credential. So I'm working in the area of endocrinology and diabetes now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so for students who are on the call who are sort of thinking about a career in healthcare and medicine, just want to hear from your experience. How has all of your experience, including your clinical rotation, research projects, volunteer work, really influenced your decision to pursue a career in medicine? And at what point did you say, uh-huh, I'm in the right place. This is what I really want to do. 
and I'll I can start with you, Caroline. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I'll just go ahead because I think my my journey is maybe a little bit more non traditional. I can't speak for Dr. Kalan, but um, obviously I, I went in a different a different area first, and then decided I wanted to pursue uh, more of a medical role. And so, you know, I think all of my cumulative experiences have led me to be where I am today, and I've never once looked back. Um, that being said, my dietetic internship, which is kind of like I like to kind of describe it akin to a residency for dietitians. We have to do it uh, post-grad before we can, you know, sit for boards and practice. Mine was extremely medically focused. I did it at a, a VA hospital in Minneapolis, and um, I was able to scrub in in surgeries and really be involved in the medical aspect of things, which I think piqued my interest. Um, I went on to then pursue a career in uh, cystic fibrosis as a dietitian, where I was managing a lot of things like pancreatic enzyme replacement, and so got to really rub elbows with the physicians and um, be a part of that, uh, the medical care of, of patients as well. So that's what really inspired me to go on to pursue more. Um, but again, it's, it's been a mixture of asking questions, being curious, and then being able to um, kind of practice to the top of my license in that role is what sort of led me to my, where I am today, I guess. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Dr. K? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, and just to clarify the question, it was how we got here today, or like, I guess what specific question do you want us to answer? Yeah, just curious, at what point did you just, did it click in your mind that you wanted to pursue a career in medicine? Is Was it your clinical rotation, like research projects? What made it click for you? Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't repeating what I yeah. always said. So um, I think for me, it was definitely uh, more so like personal reasons. I think that a medicine was more of something that I, um, for like I mentioned, representation, like seeing doctors who can relate to me um, growing up um, the way I did. I think that was really my initial urge. And so I think that personal drive was like so motivating for me. And I, I think that ended up being the reason why I immerse myself into the field of medicine and rotations. And obviously when you see other people do it, you are so motivated to want to do it. But I think when you have like a personal reason um, that you want to make a change, I think no matter what that avenue becomes for you, it becomes fulfilling. So I think whether I did became a physician or a PA, like, you know, no matter what, I think if I was just able to make that change, which for me specifically was seeing more physicians who could relate to my background, um, who were really passionate in providing compassionate care to people of all backgrounds, um, that would have been fulfilling no matter what. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And before I move on to my next question, just want to get a sense of who's on the call with us today. So if you all can type in the chat, um, what your aspiring career is, what do you hope um, to become in healthcare? I know a lot of us are looking at the PA routes, some medical routes, so we'd love to know who on the call, who is on the call and, and what you're sort of where you are in your healthcare journey. And so in my experience, one of the advice that I've heard, especially for students is get that clinical experience. It's very important when you're ready to apply for PA school, medical school. What advice would you give to students who are seeking to gain those relevant medical experience and opportunities to enhance their medical school application? Yeah, I can go first. Um, so I, I definitely think, and I always talk about this, but I really mean it when I say um, trying to get like paid clinical experience is probably the way to go, not just because you're getting paid, but I think when you have that responsibility where you're like responsible for a certain role, no matter what that role is in the medical team, I think that the um, sense of like, not just like empowerment, but also education is a lot higher because you have this, um, you know, responsibility to fulfill. So I think give you an example, if you are just shadowing a doctor, right, you are definitely learning a lot and you're kind of following someone around. But if you're a medical assistant to a doctor, you are kind of responsible to get go through each patient's like, you know, information and like take vitals and like work with the doctor directly in the treatment plan. And I think that in itself is not just a great role because you learn more, but I think that you also get paid, you know, for the time you spend there. Um, so I personally felt like when I was doing paid clinical experience, um, that was when I learned the most. Um, so I was in your scribe. Um, I got to work as an assistant without like an unofficial assistant for a physician. So I know that that was definitely fulfilling. But in my experience, I think those roles really help you grow and really help you in leadership skills as well when you are responsible for tasks um, in a role in a healthcare setting. Yeah, no, that's great information. And I'm just curious from your standpoint, Caroline, since you have more of the untraditional path, what sort of mm -hmm. advice would you give to students? 
Yeah, I would echo that. Um, obviously, my experience leading up to my PA application was, you know, being a clinician in my own way. I was, you know, creating plans, providing care plans for patients only in the nutrition world. So still making autonomous decisions, clinical decisions, uh, evaluating patients from a holistic standpoint. So that was what I guess made me stand apart in that way. But I think, you know, beyond, beyond even clinical roles like say CNA or some of the more traditional ones we might think of, anything that is touching a patient or patient facing, I think counts. So thinking more even like research opportunities, I think are really great when you're taking maybe a gap year between applying for medical school or something like that, because sometimes in clinical research roles, whether you're enrolling in clinical trials or something like that, you're, you're interacting with patients and you're again, um, practicing that communication, communications, everything. Um, so in addition to that, and what's already been said, any role in which you can take a leadership position, whether that be like a club or something on campus where you are, you know, kind of interacting with a large cr crowd of people, I think uh, speaks a, a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. And in looking at a personal statement, I know a lot of times once you build that wealth of knowledge, you have all the experience. It's really hard sometimes to put that on paper and really putting it on paper in a way that tells a story and also a sort of showcases that you're ready to take that next step into medical school. So what is your advice for how students can effectively um, reflect and articulate their medical experiences in a compelling and authentic way when applying? And either one can take the question. <laughs> I never want to talk over her, but I'll, I'll let you go first, Caroline. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, that's such a good question, Janie. And it's a really tough one to answer because everybody's so different. We're all going to bring such unique experiences to the table. It's just important to speak authentically and true to yourself. Um, you know, having some sort of narrative, I think is really intriguing from, in my opinion, as somebody who's sat on uh, review boards, you know, and, and admissions committees and things for, for incoming students. Uh, speaking in that true authentic voice is really what's going to set you apart, but then doing that in a way that still meets the objective criteria, showing the things you've learned, showing kind of hashing out your experiences, telling that story. For me, I really had to convey a convincing story why I wanted to completely change career paths. That was a really hard thing to harness in just a thousand word personal statement. So I had to make many, many versions of mine, um, but I think I was was honest. So one of my my main reasons which I pursued higher education was um, was financial. I'll be honest. Um, I don't feel like registered dietitians are sometimes paid and compensated to the best of, of what we do for the patients. Um, in many ways, in my previous role, I felt like I was almost bleeding, like my scope of practice was bleeding into somewhat of a PA role um, uh, in and of itself. So I had sort of been, been truthful in that way. I sort of called out the elephant in the room. And I think that was actually a refreshing aspect of my personal statement. Um, and I think we're going to share maybe some excerpts from our personal statements maybe later, and that can hopefully prove a point more. But, but being authentic to yourself, but then also not just regurgitating your CV or your resume, saying things you've done and the highlights, but in a way that's kind of woven into that narrative. Yeah, thank you so much, Caroline. Dr. K? Yeah, um, that's great feedback. And I think I'll just kind of add something that may be a little bit different is that I think that most times when I read personal statements, because I do edit <clears throat> on my own as well, I've been doing this for years, is that I see that a lot of times people try to make their story fit like a narrative or like a box of like what they think a statement should look like. So they'll probably get advice from like an advisor or a counselor at school who will tell them do this, this, and this. And it's like their story doesn't fit that narrative. And so I, I just think that the best way to get the best personal statement is to be yourself and just like, write, like have a session where you just take 10 to 30 minutes, just write all your thoughts, why you want to be a doctor or a PA or, you know, whatever you want to be um, and just write and then go through and try to, you know, put different ideas in different paragraphs. Like I think so many times people try so hard to like make their statement look like somebody else's or 
with the advice of what somebody else said, but then it kind of bleeds into the story that they want to tell. So I think just know that your story is important and it fits in somewhere. Um, the, the goal in the art is to make it look good at the end, but it doesn't have to look like everyone else's. Yeah, and that's a good segue to our next question. You sort of touched on this, not necessarily trying to fit within a box, but being as authentic as possible. So in your experience, Dr. Kate, what are some things or common pitfalls that you've seen or mistakes you've seen students make and how can our audience sort of avoid those when writing their personal statements? You know, I think that I see a lot of like science majors and people who are very like their personality is completely different but they try to like write like an English major like they will say like you know I'll just say something random like I walked down a paved road that was muddy and felt the breeze of the like you don't have to write like that like this is not an English paper right like you can write just as you talk right and then we can get you know you can find someone to help you edit or you can edit at the end but you can write how you speak you don't have to make it sound like somebody in the 1800s wrote it, right? So I think um, a lot of times people tend to do that where they get the feedback that the first paragraph has to be very compelling. But compelling doesn't mean that you have to write descriptive adjectives for everything you say. Compelling can just mean you shared a story that may be shocking to the reader to hear about, right? So um, that's definitely something I see people do a lot. And then what they'll do is they'll have a lot of like uh, verbose, um, so very like they kind of ramble and they kind of do a lot of descriptive adjectives, but then the actual purpose is lost. So just be sure that you're like getting to the point and you're not spending too much time being descriptive to where it's distracting. Yeah, thank you. Any advice to share in this area, Carolyn? Sure. Um, I don't know if we have any pre-PA students in the in the chat right now, but um, one of mine. It's it sounds so silly, but it's a pet peeve of PAs is where you say physician's assistant and make it uh, apostrophe, um, knowing, you know, what roles have to be capitalized, maybe some of the more nitty gritty grammatical things. Um, also knowing, you know, how to avoid run on sentences or when you need commas, you know, just making sure everything is spelled correctly. I can't tell you how many times I see spelling errors. So making sure even if English isn't your first language too, making sure that the um, just the syntax of it sounds good and there's a good flow. Um, we may have some international students in the in the room tonight. So um, just something to be be aware of. Um, additionally, I think like Dr. Kalan said, you want the first pair Paragraph to be compelling. Um, I think don't fall into the cheese trap either with that. So many times I see like a quote or something to start off a personal statement. And that is so overdone. Don't feel like you have to do that and make that be like your hunk and, hook and sinker in the beginning. Just, just be yourself. Yeah, this is great advice. And um, I've been hosting these webinars for a little bit. And when you see student across the spectrum of, I have a lot of experience, I'm ready to write my personal statement. And then you have a student who's, well, I don't have a lot of experience. What can I put on my personal statement? What advice would you give for students to be able to demonstrate their commitment to the medical field, wherever they fall on that spectrum, whether it's having a lot of experience, not as much, to add to their personal statement. Yeah, I mean, I think it's case in point to all of our backgrounds. I mean, Dr. Kalan had a, uh, you said undergraduate in communications. That's that's not necessarily direct medical experience, but she's able to parlay it into something that's made her so successful in the medical field. I myself, I was actually a music major to start out with, and I've really reinvented myself multiple times over. So just realizing that anything can count as experience. Obviously, yes, we want relevant clinical experience for, for medical school applications or the like, but um, just knowing that you can have those translational skills and uh, it's all about just being able to show what, what challenged you, what event in your life, how you handled that, and then what the outcomes of that were, you know, just as you would in a job interview or something of that nature. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that a lot of times people struggle with, <clears throat> you know, I don't have enough experience in what I talk about, or they tend to just like list out all of their experience. So I think I would say, like Carolyn said earlier, the experiences that you have a big impact with or that you have leadership in and kind of highlighting that versus just like listing out everything you did. I think um, people tend to fixate on like one patient encounter and they kind of talk about that. But I think more importantly is to show how you grew from experience, right? Like not focusing on the patient or like one experience, but rather how that role helped you in your career as an X, Y, or Z. Yeah, no, that's helpful. 
Um, so in your experience, Dr. Kay, in looking at all the personal statements that you've gone through, what are some examples, if any, that you can provide of meaningful medical experience or patient interaction that students should be highlighting in their personal statements, knowing that not everything they've done can fit or should be on there? So I think like leadership roles should definitely, you know, be on there. So if you were like a leader of a club um, and you've been, you know, in the club for like more than a year or so, definitely include that. I think if you were um, like a medical assistant or somewhere you were, where you have direct patient care, like Caroline said earlier, um, definitely include that because that's also profound. Um, and, you know, honestly, if you also, like she, she said earlier, if you do like even bench experience, but it helped in a way that it really changed your perspective on medicine or the, the way you, you want to pursue medicine, include that. So just anything that really shifted you or helped with your growth. I think sometimes we think that that has to be a specific type of training, but it doesn't have to be. But definitely if you're a leader of a group or if you've been uh, doing direct patient care, whether it's as a medical assistant, a scribe, a, you know, a technician, all that is really profound um, medical experience and it deserves a spot in your statement. Awesome, Caroline? I will also add to, and this is maybe more specific to PA, but could be the same for pre-MDs. Um, volunteer work is something that applicants and, and um, committee members are really looking for, for PA specifically. So being able to demonstrate how you've shown you know, leadership and maybe a volunteer uh, position, I think is also important on a personal statement. And how is it to convey empathy and cultural competency? So stepping away from your clinical experience, I imagine that it's also important to be able to get to the heart and soul of whoever is reading your personal statements. So how important is it from what you've done and, and sort of all the personal statements you've read through, how important is it on a scale of most important, not as important is it to include those components in a personal statement? Um, so I speak obviously from, you know, a position of white privilege, I'll just call it out like it is. Um, and so definitely think it's important for me to acknowledge that. And um, obviously, I'm going to have different backgrounds than maybe some others on this call tonight. Um, but I think showing empathy is absolutely paramount. Uh, it's something that all committee members and an uh, admissions committee are looking for. We want somebody who's able to uh, meet the patient where they are in their journey and be able to uh, connect with people of all different backgrounds. Um, again, speaking from the PA kind of realm specifically, um, working for underserved areas is definitely something that committee members are seeking uh, just because the PA specialty is we are trained as primary care providers first and foremost. And um, obviously working in underserved areas is, is important because there is such a need. Um, I myself was always interested in working with uh, people in underserved communities. Uh, my significant other is Venezuelan and um, I do speak Spanish. And so being able to you know, provide healthcare and, and those type of environments was always something I wanted to do. And so tried to convey that in my personal statement, not only because it truly was authentic to myself, but it was always also a preferred kind of aspect of my particular program that I was applying for. So I think, you know, being able to um, not just check that box and say like, oh yeah, I want to work with underserved co communities or, oh yes, being empathetic is important and kind of sounding like ro robotic almost in a sense, but again, weaving how empathy is important into maybe some of your patient interactions or what you had spoken uh, previously in your personal statement, um, alluding to, to that as, as something you were focused on, uh, whether it was, again, working in research or working as a CNA or whatever clinical role that you had. Yeah, and just to echo on that, absolutely. I, I agree with Caroline, what she said. Um, and I guess another thing I can say is that um, you don't, you can show your cultural competence and don't have to use like a clinical experience to back it up. So what I mean by this is that if you feel like you have grown as a person and have learned how to be more culturally competent because of personal life experience, whether that's like where you went to school, where you worked, you know, just interactions you've had, that is the purpose of a personal statement is to show personal growth, right? And so don't look for always like, you know, like I say, 
the art of a personal statement, and this kind of answers the question of somebody in the chat who said, do we have to read list experiences on our CV? The art of it is to combine those experiences with your personal life and kind of tell a story of how both of those impacted your growth. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I imagine there are a lot of tips, resources out there that students can take advantage of when crafting their personal statements. What resources have you found to be most helpful in your journey when you were crafting yours? We can start with you, Dr. K. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I was seeing if Caroline uh, was going to talk, um, but I was know, responding to a question in the chat. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll just go ahead. Um, I think so. It's been like what, like eight years since my personal statement from from med school, and I'll speak to like even my residency one. Personally, like I think I'm a writer like at heart, so I think for me, I just I took someone's advice, which I saw. Um, I like just googled like you know, and I took the advice of brainstorm writing, which is essentially just like writing out my thoughts and revising them. So I would just say like, if you don't know where to start with resources, literally just a quick Google search on the personal statement that you're writing will pop up a lot of, um, you know, samples and like advice tips. And there's like tons of websites. I don't wanna just list one or two because there's tons. So I think at the time I definitely did like do a quick Google search to see where to start. But I think um, what helped me the most essentially was like I mentioned earlier, like just taking some time to like write all your thoughts out and then sorting them out at the end. Um, that was kind of my blueprint. And then thinking more recently to residency when I was applying for the match. Um, during that time, I think like uh, what we'll talk about soon is like kind of taking advice from other people with matching the specialty I wanted. Um, that's kind of what I did. And if you actually, like I said, Google, just a quick Google search of like X specialty personal statement, you'll see like samples online. So that's pretty helpful um, as a starting point. Again, it's really tricky though, because you don't want it to sound like somebody else's, but you also want to see how somebody else was able to convey a message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Caroline? Yeah, I definitely agree with all those um, ideas and statements. Um, I think also, I love the idea of like Dr. Colon said, you know, writing down all of your ideas and kind of patchworking them together later. Um, just think back to like English class 101, your intro, your body and your outro and kind of understanding the framework and the bones of a good statement and a good essay, if you will. Um, but then knowing too how you can weave in your ideas in a way that flows well. And I think you can only do that by just brain dumping everything on a big piece of paper and just having like a just a free flow brainstorming session and being okay with the fact that your your personal statement is going to have so many iterations I think I literally had like maybe 20 versions of my statement before I finally got to something that I liked so I took at least two or three months to write mine um, not to put any pressure in anybody in the chat you know if you've got a, a due date coming up but knowing that it's a process and you have to let things marinate and sit on it another tip that I have too is have as many people read the statement as possible, knowing ahead of time that at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. It's your statement. You get to decide to decide what edits and critiques you want. But I think having people from all different backgrounds, both medical and non read personal statements, you get such good feedback because everybody has unique life experiences and they may, you know, shed light on something you had no idea uh, really stood out or really sounded good. And you might be able to get something different from that. Um, and then I agree, you know, always having role models and, and looking for people who have done what you want to do, right? So I had several PAs uh, share their personal statements with me, and I kind of looked at what worked and what didn't, and then kind of parlayed that, parlayed that into my own work. Yeah, that's, that's good. And it's a good segue to my question as well. And I see one in the chat that talks about what specific characteristics do panelists or panels look for? And thank you for your response to that, Dr. K. Just curious if you had anything to share in that regard. And you talk about intro, body, outro, and that sounds very simplified. And some students might still be wondering, well, what do I put in my intro? What do I put in the body? If you have like examples that you can share with us to see what a, a personal statement could look like, we're open to that. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to share an excerpt of mine. I think for me personally, I had to, um, like I mentioned earlier, explain and kind of convey where I was currently, what role I was in, 
characteristics and, and um, strengths of mine that I built and that I showed in my role there then, but then, you know, I had to explain in the body of my personal statement, my drive for wanting to change careers and areas of, of uh, work within the clinical field. And so I sort of did that in several body paragraphs. And then I ended it um, by kind of summarizing what I had said earlier, uh, but then also explaining that I would make a good candidate for the program based on what they were looking for. And previously I had demonstrated um, ways in which I showed that. Um, should I go ahead and read now or do we want to? Okay. Um, so I'll just read the first body paragraph. So in the beginning, I won't read that because it is so unique to me, but um, I, I tried to kind of create like a striking um, scenario, something that I actually did do. I'll, I'll just go ahead and read the beginning too. Um, so my, my previous career uh, as part of my job as a dietitian, I worked in cystic fibrosis. So we were constantly conveying bad news to parents. Um, we were the first kind of team that the parents met with after their baby had uh, flagged positive on the newborn screen for having cystic fibrosis. So my intro statement goes like this. My hand was shaking as I pushed open the clinic door. I hesitated a moment, taking a deep breath because I knew once inside, we'd be communicating the words that would forever change a young family's life. Your sh child has cystic fibrosis. It becomes an indelible moment when you and your team are the messengers of a frightening new reality, one where an imagined future of expected milestones is instantly changed. At that moment, clinical practice collides with humanity and how that moment is approached both professionally and emotionally is critical. My collective life and career experiences have prepared me for such moments. Becoming a physician assistant will allow me to address such situations in the best way possible. So that was my intro, uh, my first body paragraph. As the registered dietitian, RD, I did that to save word count because word counts on these statements are really tight. As the RD for the Mayo Cystic Fibrosis Center, I educate patients as part of a multidisciplinary team. Cultivating positive relationships with both the individual patient and the parent is crucial if I'm to be successful with each case. And such success centers on navigating family dynamics and understanding cultural differences. With that awareness in mind, I'm able to communicate vital information in such a way that everyone understands. So showing my communication as a strength, that was kind of one of my pillars of strengths. I'm able to communicate vital information. Okay, sorry, I said that already. Sometimes family conflicts or individual personalities dominate an appointment. My focus must be constantly flexible, ready to redirect attention, conversation, and attitudes. My role as RD in this specialty is unique because I have the responsibility of managing patients' pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, and physicians consult me to make initial dose recommendations. Without proper adjust adjustment of this medication, patients with CF would be unable to gain appropriate weight to maintain lung function. So just to kind of explain what I was doing there, I had to show um, in a very tight condensed paragraph, some of my skills. So communication, being flexible in the moment, working and um, trying to meet patients where they were when we were dealing with really chaotic, kind of stressful, high stress scenarios. And then um, also showing the fact that I was doing more than just the typical dietitian telling you to eat your fruits and veggies, right? I was working with physicians, I was getting consulted. Um, so trying to kind of convey that in one, in one paragraph was a little bit easier said than done. But again, I'm not saying mine's perfect. There are cer certain things that, you know, some people would say, oh, cringy, but for me, it worked and I got in and now I'm practicing. So that's that. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing, Carolina. I'm, I'm sure that's helpful for folks on the call. Dr. K, anything to add to that in terms of really how to condense all of your experience into intro, body, outro? <laughs> I like pull up my old, I just somehow found my old personal statement and I'm over like about to cry. So I'm not going to reread it because it's a lot of personal stuff. <laughs> but um, one thing I'll say is like just reading it, like I see that I had the spirit of a hustler and I kind of put it into like, I'll kind of talk about how I put that into a statement because what I mean by that and the reason I, I kind of encourage that is because I think I really showed how I was like hardworking and resilient throughout my statement. And I think to summarize the answer to your question, I think the most important thing is to have a theme. So like, even if your intro body and, and outro 
have different ideas, the theme should be the same. So for example, the intro should introduce who you are to the reader, but also leave them wondering and wanting to know more about you. And then the body is kind of where I would go into any specific clinical experience, any personal experiences that help with your growth. Um, and then, you know, specifics into why you are a hardworking person, why you are resilient, why you are a leader, why you'd make a great PA, a great doctor, right? And then your outro should be essentially the summary and like a selling paragraph, you know, like, hey, now you know I am all these things and this is why I, what, sets, what sets me apart from another candidate, right? So I think, um, again, uh, and now that I'm reading, and I, I know, Janie, we talked about this and I was like, can't find my statement. I just found it. <laughs> And I'm actually kind of glad that it's not on screen right now. I'd probably cry, but I reading it, I see that I was like pretty open about my struggles. And I think um, if anything, that probably helped me because I like somebody asked in the, in the questions, they do ask you about your statements in your interviews. So if you can put something in there that you're okay discussing um, during the interview, it's a great place to be vulnerable. I mean, I'm honestly, no one's going to read this besides you and the admissions committee. And if you don't get into school, they'll never see you again. If you get into the school, it's just going to help you and let them know who you are. Right. So don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Um, but I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you so much to you both for sharing. Um, I do have a question in the Q&A. Is there anything specific that could boost my chances of getting accepted into BSMD programs? I don't know if that's with, I don't know if the question is within the context of, you know, a personal statement or just generally, but anytime. Yeah, I, I don't know. Is this person in high school and trying to get into BSMD? Are they in, I'm assuming they're in high school. Can they tell in the chat? Yeah, can you tell? Usually it's uh, it's high schoolers. Or like yes, first or second. In high school. Mm -hmm. high yeah, school. yeah. So um so I know a little bit about B BSMD. There's like a few in the country. Um typically it's just the matter of like being competitive. I mean, things you can do to show that is to take like college level classes in high school and do well, take AP classes, right? Like um you can do like I would say like in that case, the volunteer work obviously helps, but from my understanding, most of those programs are very much like numbers based because they want to see that you can handle the core, like the rigor of the BSMD because it's like a condensed program. They usually condense the med school um, and your bachelor's into like six or seven years. So unfortunately, a lot of those programs do have a higher emphasis on like GPA um, and then like your SAT, ACT scores. So uh, again, if you ask me specifics, we can get into that, but like generally that's the theme. Thank you. Another question asks, when I write about the gender gap or minorities in medicine, should I avoid mentioning numbers and statistics? You know, I think that it it's interesting because I actually wrote a whole statistic in my statement. I wrote like how 3% of medical students come from families in the bottom 20% of annual income. So, cause I was really, really passionate about increasing representation of like low income students specifically. Um, so I wrote that and people love that. So I would say, don't be afraid to write that as long as you can back that up in an interview when they ask you like, where'd you get the statistic from? So just make sure your sources are accurate um, and that you're writing like widely known um, stats on there and not just something that you read on like a blog post or something. Yeah. Thank you. I'm looking across the chat and Q&A. I don't see any additional questions. Um, so in the meantime, I don't know if folks are still typing in. What other tips, resources, how can students get in contact with you both if they have questions about, you know, crafting a personal statement, they need additional support or just to get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm oh, sorry, Caroline. I'm just like talking, but I'm gonna just let this <laughs> up and let you talk. Um, so I um, definitely, um, um, Danny knows and Caroline knows. I do uh, content creation, and so my page is just like I'll put it in the chat. It's Dr. K A Y D O. So I put post lots of tips on personal statements um, on my page, and uh, I'll be able to like help students one on one, and all the information's like on my page. But um, if you want to message me, please email me or send me a DM. I'm happy to help. Um, and then uh, I do typically share like what students I've worked with, like excerpts with their permission um, from time to time on my page. So, um, you know, those are also pretty helpful. Um, and also just, I think uh, other ways 
other tips that I would have for you guys is something that I kept saying, but I stand by it. And that is just to be yourself and really honor and embrace your story. Like, I think so, we just sleep on ourselves. Sometimes we have imposter syndrome. We think that we're not special. Like this doesn't matter, but like it really does. And, you know, you can take any story and make it profound if you have the confidence to do so. And so um, I would just say, believe in the power, like the power of your story and just like know that it's, it's important, you know, and, and maybe not to in your world, but like you saying that story out loud and somebody else reading it may find a lot of inspiration. And so just don't sleep on yourself. Like, you know, don't doubt yourself. Don't think that your story doesn't matter or that, Hey, this isn't important. Or like, I'm not going to make it because if you go in with that mindset, you won't have the creativity to write. I really do believe that being in creative space requires some kind of privilege and some kind of like confidence. And that does take some like belief in your future and determination. So um, starting with that would be really, really helpful to get to a good place. Thank you. I love all those comments. I think they're so, so true is, you know, having that, that self-confidence to just go for it and, you know, just throw caution to the wind. And I think I know from a personal way that I get caught up in my own imposter syndrome when I think along those lines of, oh, you know, this sounds so, so overdone or this, somebody's already said this before, but, you know, just having that self-confidence and just ignoring all the noise around you is really important. Um, I obviously have a much different uh, career background and path than Dr. Klan. So, um, you know, can speak to, to PAs or anybody else that maybe is not in the MD um, track, but I'm also uh, a creator on uh, social media. My page is The Clinic Dietitian on Instagram, TikTok, whatever. Um, so happy to reach out and further discuss, you know, some of your questions and things. Um, I have worked maybe not to the same extent that Dr. Klan has with uh, personal statement writing, but definitely have sat on committees for, you know, incoming students and generally know, I think what, what, people are looking for. Obviously, this is just one piece of the giant application puzzle, right? We look at everything. We look at GPA, which I can address that question here in a minute. We look at your resume, your experiences, but the personal statement is your time to really shine and just have fun with it because this is the one, the only uh, part of your application that's really going to highlight your personality. So like it's been mentioned before, being authentic, being creative. If you do feel like you are a creative person or you have a, a um, vulnerable story to share or something like that. This is your moment to do that. So, um, and, and understanding like this is just a, a jumping block from for further discussion and conversation in your interview, which is the ultimate goal, right? Um, I think when it does come to GPA, uh, you, if you do have say a lower one or something, this is a great way to show that resiliency that we said is important in medicine. Um, maybe you retook a class or you, know, you worked on something to further improve your GPA after. Maybe you have a legitimate reason and why your GPA was lower than it needed to be. Maybe you were caring for a family member who was ill. Maybe you were dealing with um, personal health issues. There's so much more to that story. And I really hate it when programs just hang up an applicant's uh, total package based on GPA. I think programs are getting more and more away from that, just like they're getting away from some of the standardized test scores and things, which I think is really important, um, especially for people who say don't test well, or maybe don't have that um, ability. Maybe you have ADHD. And so sometimes, you know, maintaining that 4.0 is just not, not conceivable. So um, it's something if it's, I don't know what the threshold would be for, you know, the time to mention GPA, but if you yourself feel like it's a red flag, then yeah, definitely address the L fit in the room. I think being transparent is, is really important. Thank you, Caroline. And I see we have one more question that just came in. What is the right time to start writing your personal statements? Is it as you are obtaining experience? Do you advise waiting a little bit closer to when you're ready to apply for medical school or PA school? What is the right time? You know, that's a great question. Um, you can always be like, oh, there is a right time. And it's like a different time for everybody, but just to be more specific I definitely think that six months before you are about to apply is definitely when you should start like brainstorming and writing because I actually believe that like sometimes you'll write you like what the heck was I thinking when I wrote that right and so you're gonna have like multiple what the heck moments and I think to have a really good final statement 
three to six months before like you actually apply is a great time to start writing. And that way you have like a brainstorming phase, you have a content fixing phase, and then you'll have a grant. Cause you know, I do think there's like layers to how you edit. And I think the first layer will be like fixing the content up, making sure it flows well. And then you'll do the grammar, grammar and making sure, you know, you get it checked for grammar and everything like that. So three, six months, I think is like a good starting point. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would agree with that. I would say just the sooner the better. Um, you know, I, uh, like I mentioned, I had like 20 versions of my personal statement. So I think you're not going to be able to show that creativity and that authentic self if you feel the pressure of a deadline. So we're most creative when we're kind of in an idle space and we're able to just have the, the no pressure. Um, I don't care what you say. If you're like, if you have that uh, ability to do good work under a deadline, just please don't take that mentality into your personal statement. Give yourself a, ample time to do this. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions in the chat or Q and A. Um, so I just wanna say thank you to you both for sharing your experience and your insight. I hope that our audience have found it very helpful and enlightening. Um, I know one takeaway for me from today's discussion is a personal statement or at least a compelling one is not just about listing your accomplishments. It's really talking about how unique you are and your contribution to the medical field. And for those who are joining us for the first time and you're looking for um, clinical experience that could potentially go on your personal statement, advanced clinical training is the place to be. We offer online certification programs for students who are looking for that direct patient care and are really looking to excel in the healthcare industry. So we hope that you would consider us in your healthcare journey. And I do wanna say thank you to Caroline and Dr. Kalan for joining us today. Um, we hope to see you all in future webinars. And if there are no additional questions in the chat, we can go ahead and end here and then hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Jamie and everyone else who helped with this. Of course. Bye. Bye.